I'm going to start with a quote. Thou art the fountainhead from which we draw vivifying waters from our meadows. We frankly confess that we have been guided by thee, assisted by thy judgments, enlightened by thy radiance, and finally, that it was under thy auspices, so to speak, that I have gained this ability as a writer, such as it is, and I have attained my purpose. While the contents of this letter, letter fit well with the general tenor of humanism, this is not a letter actually sent from one contemporary to another, but written by the 14th century Francesco Petrarch and addressed to the conjured up ghost of the first century BC Roman Cicero. It was one of several imaginary epistles Petrarch composed to classical authors, including Virgil, Livy and Homer. Should we deem Petrarch's composition here an example of classical reception? While it technically might fall under that heading, reception would seem a very sterile term for what lies behind the force and visceral fervour that Petrarch gives voice to. Perception, conception, and even self-deception might be preferable to reception. But to probe our own nomenclature for this phenomenon is only to gesture at making a case for the extraordinary vitality and versatility of the relationship that the Renaissance had with the classical past. And let's linger for a moment on this letter of Petrarch. What is Petrarch saying to Cicero? He seems to be suggesting that he's read Cicero not just in order to learn to write, but also to help solve daily problems of conduct. In modern studies, while we might read the classical text for a range of reasons, such as historical interest, translation practice, and even pleasure, we don't approach them as resources of intellectual progression or personal development. This then, ladies and gentlemen, is the nub of the issue. We need to make a leap into the cultural flow of the early moderns, many of whom fancied themselves in intimate conversation with the classical writers and viewed their works as a laboratory of life that could be plugged into. Indeed, a key message of this lecture is that classical reception is not an inert or backward looking exercise, nor should it be viewed as an extra in the study of the Renaissance. That it has sometimes been come to regard it as such is a regrettable product of the highly compartmentalized education systems of today. Instead, we need to think of a deep urge to reanimate the past and the present in a sort of mythical communion. And the prevalence of that imagined presence should not be underestimated. While classical reception entailed many and sometimes complex modes of engagement, ranging from idealization and emulation to contestation and defiance, in all cases, the ancient world was an obvious, ubiquitous and central occupant in the early modern hearts and minds. It's only by the 18th and 19th centuries that the classical tradition became optional, so to speak. Think of the physical building of the Warburg Institute. It's a crucible of the Renaissance, and in its hives of, hive of rooms, be it the library, Michelle O'Malley's office, Bill Sherman's study, the grad pad, classroom one, and so on and so on, one can find the footprints of the Greco-Roman world. To put it bluntly, without an appreciation of the spread and spirit of classical reception, we cannot understand the early modern period, or indeed the war book. But before going further, a few health warnings. While the fix of the talk, this talk may be the classical world, this in no way seeks to suggest 
that it was the only source of influence in the early modern period. The Greco-Roman tradition was only one of several in European history, nor am I concerned with the relative value of the classical legacy, and God forbid on any sort of mission to assert its superiority. In fact, the field of classics has in recent years made immense efforts to acknowledge the taint of elitism, or as Mary Beard puts it, its toxic inheritance. Classicists have effectively promoted the fact that Western civilization is a contested idea and that there was a chain of receptions rather than just one. To the extent that anything I say today seems to point to the ascendancy of classical reception, it is only because the early moderns who embraced that heritage willed it to be so. An additional caveat concerns references to the Renaissance, and I know you've had a lecture on this. It is, of course, a constructive term. And in using it, I mean in no way to disparage or caricature the Middle Ages as a period of cultural darkness. That would fail to take into account swathes of excellent research to the, the contrary. And as I will suggest in passing, the medieval approach to classical texts was both formative and relevant. It's also important to keep in mind that there have been classical revivals prior to the Renaissance, the Carolingian Kulturkampf of the 9th century, and what is sometimes called the Proto-Renaissance of the 12th. The final qualification I'll here make here concerns remit. While the focus of this talk is literary, classical reception has tentacles everywhere and is germane not only to texts, but also to images, artifacts, music, and countless else. So onwards. In the next 40 or so minutes, I will identify six key areas, for six is the magic number. And via these, I hope to offer a holistic sense of what reception might involve and to provide some helpful vantage points for anyone embarking on a close exegesis of an early modern text. The first three areas are more scene setting in nature and pertain to the practical side of the actual digestion of classical texts. The second set of areas offer rather more conceptual provocations and relate to the theory and the ideology behind reception. And in and around these six areas, I'm going to be making reference to some specific classical authors whose utilization seems best to encapsulate the major trends of classical reception. Let's begin with our first area, physical access. By this, I mean the actual availability of classical texts, the Renaissance is best known as a period of retrieval of classical literature, and while a good number of authors, including Aristotle and Ovid, were known to the Middle Ages, the literary store was appreciably enlarged in the Renaissance, many works appearing for the first time. Discoveries emerged from the libraries across Europe, the corners of shelves in monasteries, and even from the ground itself. Um, and at the excavation of the Apollo Belvedere here. Petrarch is often heralded as the father figure in stimulating the rediscovery of texts, but the questing instinct was one common to many. In 1392, the corpus of Cicero's correspondence was nearly doubled when, when the Milanese chancellor, De Capelli, discovered a codex of Cicero's familiares. At the start of the 15th century, Bracciolini combed European monasteries, unearthing Latin texts by Columella, Lucretius, Manilius, Quintilian, and Statius. On the Greek side, prior to 1350, the number of classical Greek manuscripts in circulation had been fairly scanty. But during the Renaissance, almost the entire body of Greek literature that we know today was deposited in Western libraries, indeed often trans, uh, transmitted from the Islamic East, and Charles Burnett uh, knows much more about this than I. In the world's words of Paul Oster, Oscar Christella, Renaissance humanism extended its knowledge almost to the entire range of its extant remains. 
individual discoveries were crucial, there were other important reasons for the sheer availability of Renaissance texts. And the advent of print helped achieve levels of diffusion that were unthinkable previously. A, wide biling a widespread bilingualism and attendant translation skills also helped keep the classical works at the forefront of cultural consciousness, especially in the case of Greek texts that might for many be off limits. And translations really did constitute a vital line of access with some versions almost achieving the status of the original. For example, Jack Amiot's French translation of Plutarch on the continent and in England, Chapters, Chapman's Homer. Indeed, one thing to bear in mind when analyzing the classical temper of a work is the degree to which it has been refracted through early modern translations. For example, Shakespeare through Golden's beautiful version of Ovid's Metamorphoses. There existed wider opportunities for assimilation too. And it's worth giving a moment's attention to the second area I'll mention, the nature of early modern education, a system through which all those producing texts in this period would have passed. Early modern pedagogy came to be dominated by classical literature. Exposure began at school level and a brief description of standard day at Eton says it all, and this is on the slide. Classical texts were expected to provide not only vocabulary and phrases for composition into Latin, but also edifying subject matter. Much ink was spilt over the education of the young with prescriptions, for instance, that students read texts four times over. There, were, there was also the practice of double translation, whereby a student first renders a piece of literature into English and then turns their own translation back into the original Latin or Greek. This time of type of exercise must have fostered a deep affinity with the ancient oeuvre and encouraged students to inhabit texts in the way that is rare in modern programmes of study. The exposure continued at university level. The ordinances for the gymnasium or University of Strasbourg drawn up by the humanist Johanna Sturm, for example, while of course in part aspirational, contain detailed provisions for the inculcation of inter alia, Aristotle's organon for rhetorical improvement and Plato's laws for honing a student's grasp of political philosophy. So great was this immersion it almost certainly meant for a sort of psychological convergence too. Indeed, I wonder if Renaissance responses to events generally may be mapped quite closely onto ancient psychological reactions to parallel phenomena. And alongside such regulations was the message that the telos of education was the production of civic minded and religiously pious citizen body. A byproduct of all this, of course, was that a grasp of classical literature became bound up with social mobility and career success. And when examining the contours of classical reception, rather less edifying considerations, such as fashion, patronage, and commercial value, and even a sort of classical arms race, cannot, I'm afraid, be ignored. While such structures helped ensure a widespread engagement with classical texts, we can also interrogate the filters through which access was mediated. And this brings me to my third area. Certain epoch-making humanists had a considerable influence in this respect. And it won't surprise you to hear that Erasmus was a primary agent. There were two quarters in which his recommendations were pivotal. Firstly, through his uh, formal demarcation of a canon of classical texts. This comprised a happy meal of carefully selected classical authors 
on the basis of what was wholesome and what was useful. In Greek, Lucian and Demosthenes were included, and in Latin, La uh, Latin Virgil, Horace, Cicero, and Caesar. More cynically, of course, we might ask whether Erasmus's canon formation was in fact driven by the preferences of leading printers. His association with Aldus Minutius, for example, is well documented. While others would vary the Erasmian strictures for such reading, the fact is that this practice of authorization was often determinative of the sorts of classical texts that people encountered. Erasmus had a second impact. In his seminal De Ratione Studii, students were advised to quarry the literature they read for choice phrases and sentences and to copy these into their books. This process of extraction and listing, also deployed in medieval times, would in fact prove to be extremely important and, get, and gave rise to a popular practice of commonplace wisdom. Erasmus himself would produce such compilations, most famously as adages, a collection of more than 4,000 classical maxims, and a book considered by many as an indispensable resource. The publication of such florilegia gatherings of rhetorical flowers abounded during the early modern period and I'm not myself convinced that we have fully taken into account the extent to which these storehouses of tasty morsels conditioned the intellectual habits of Renaissance practitioners. As modern readers of literature we tend to think of texts as wholes but in the Renaissance there was a much broader view of unity that was achieved through the activity of excerpting and anthologizing. So far, I have considered, the, the, in a more practical way, the conditions that facilitated classical reception. I now want to explore three rather trickier aspects of the phenomenon, imitation, authority, and religion. Let's start with imitation a hugely influ influential practice that was arguably the hallmark of the Renaissance. Put simply, imitatio entailed copying certain features of style and content that were characteristic of a classical model. In reality, it was actually a rather complex operation. Treatises on the topic were ten a penny, and it became a major talking point for the literati across Europe. Imitatio could involve the reproduction of language, and it might entail adherence to one author's style or a more eclectic approach in which a mosaic of favourite authors was stitched together. An early modern writer could be imitative in a more open and conspicuous way, or in a furtive manner, the technical term for this is criminal. Insofar as classical genres tended to have an organising idea at their centre, generic affiliation was also possible. And we can witness this in the Italian poet Sanazzaro, for example, progressing as the Roman poet Virgil did from pastoral poetry to epic. I also think that the extent uh, that the early moderns might reflect an attachment to a classical author as much as to their work, in so far as that happens, we need to distance ourselves from a post-structuralist death of the author mindset. In the Renaissance, there was an obsessive interest in the lives and the mores of classical writers. But a few more words can be said about the premises that lay behind imitation. Imitatio, wasn't about mechanical reproduction or mindless obeisance. That would have resulted in literary stagnation. Rather, Renaissance appropriation happened in a dynamic dialectic with a classical author. Imitation was coupled with an independent creativity, often accompanied by an intense desire to compete with and even outstrip 
the past masters. But even while imitatio in fact involved a balance between emulation and self-assertion, further complicating the picture was the fact that novelty per se was held in disapproval. For early moderns, anything new that was introduced to the literary feast had to be somehow connected to the past. As Keith Thomas has, had put it, an inventor was a person who rediscovered something that had been lost. And early modern pioneers regularly referred to their own creative contributions as restorations of ancient wisdom. In the Renaissance mentality, innovation and renovation were one and the same. This was even true of the way Renaissance authors spoke about the act of imitation itself. They were well aware that their own habit of following the ancients had precedent in the Romans imitation of the Greeks and the Greeks concept of mimesis. Roger Ascombe's famous work, The Schoolmaster, contains one of the most substantial early modern discussions along these lines. He urged students to consider how, for example, Virgil used Homer or how Cicero used Demosthenes, paying attention to what had been omitted, added and changed. Suffice it to say, Renaissance authors and readers were constantly asked to reflect on how earlier and later texts related to each other. It's at this point I come to the first of the four authors I selected for special mention. A behemoth when it came to the process of imitation was Marcus Tullius Cicero, often referred to affectionately as Tully. The ascendancy of Cicero across the centuries as a model to emulate is difficult to dispute. Even in cases of divergence from this norm, authors would accordingly be dubbed non-Ciceronian rather than anything more positive. Renaissance humanists found Cicero's style an especially attractive one, and we're talking here lots of balanced symmetry, as you can see on the slide, and even a sort of musical prose rhythm. However, a sort of slavish following soon set in with Cicero, and there were some who refused to use any vocabulary or syntax that was not found in Cicero's writings. Can you imagine? It'd be like all musicians only following the lyrical patterns found in the Beatles. Not all agreed with such a servile approach. And in the early 1500s, a controversy broke out uh, about the conduct of Ciceronian imitation. And extraordinarily, it was one that rumbled on for more or less the rest of the century. The crux of this pivoted on a tension of great significance. And, and stay here with me, folks. Namely, the relationship between reis and verba, or action and words. Following the spirit of Quintilian's classical formula for the orator, a good man skilled in speaking, Many during this period explicitly correlated linguistic propriety with personal decorum. Erasmus was especially critical of the Ciceronian junkies, and though he himself was profoundly committed to linguistic finesse, he deemed the Ciceronian addiction a form of verbal idolatry. Erasmus didn't believe that such digital precision should be the ultimate goal, and was more concerned with how Latin might be used to improve Christian manners and morals. And so it came about that there was a shift in emphasis from Cicero as a rhetorical expert to Cicero as guide in public life. And it was in this context that certain works of moral philosophy by Cicero acquired almost biblical standing. His day of thickies on duties would provide virtually the whole infrastructure for early modern discussions on civic life. And his day anakitia on friendship would serve to underpin the notion of humanist collegiality and buttress the notion of Renaissance universal man. 
Related to imitation, my fifth aspect of classical reception is authority. Again, this constitutes another facet of the early modern psyche that we have to work hard to grasp. For as the great art critic Ernst Gomprich perceptively wrote, no dogma of the classical creed is more alien to 20th century views than its, its acceptance of authority. The notion of authority has a deeply negative image in modern times and an abhorrence of it permeates our entire outlook. Yet in the Renaissance, appeals to ancient authority were very normal. And one of the most, uh, one of the foremost authorities in both medieval and early modern periods was Aristotle. Few authors can have enjoyed as extensive or enduring a life as this author, whose writing forms almost a continuous thread through the West's literary history. Right through the Middle Ages, Aristotle had a strong institutional presence in universities and academies across Europe and became a backbone of scholastic theology. The Renaissance is often characterized as an era during which Aristotle's standing diminished, but this couldn't be further from the truth. With the onset of the Renaissance, his importance only grew and in an increasing range of fields. This can be measured by the unprecedented number of Aristotelian commentaries produced. Between 1500 and 1650, nine on 7,000 uh, were written, dwarfing the 750 listed for the 15th century. The Aristotelian corpus was used as a matrix, textbooks and encyclopedias, and as a starting point for treatises on a host of questions. Aristotle's universality is one thing, but what's as interesting is the way his authority operated. The prestige of the Aristotelian brand was used to buttress a full range of newer doctrines and agendas. With the onset of the Reformation, he was picked up by the leading religious reformers, and Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, for example, was central to Philip Melanchthon's work on morality. Other Aristotelian works, such as the Rhetoric and the Ars Poetica, similarly assumed greater prominence as activity in the areas of oratory and poetry burgeoned. Even champions of the new science doffed their cap, with Galileo Galilei energetically describing himself as a disciple of the ancient Aristotle. Although Galileo and many philosophers and scientists of the day, for them unqualified subscription to Aristotelian authority was probably specious, the imprimatur value he offered was too advantageous to relinquish. In this sense, just as with imitatio, a paradox underpinned the principle of authority. The need to give the impression of respecting tradition while pursuing new ideas. It captures a delicate calibration between morphology on the one hand and history on the other that was first identified by Abby Warburg in the realm of the visual arts, whereby a term which, though it ostensibly remains the same, doesn't necessarily bear the same meaning over the years. Further insight into this may be witnessed in early modern reactions to the sovereignty of Aristotle, and there were some detractors. Aristotle was for many decades opposed not with fresh material, but rather with other ancient authors, for example, Plato. The Platonic corpus, unlike Aristotle's, was a relative parvenu in the Western world, not gracing many desks until the 15th century. Platonic teaching was welcomed into the Christian world for his ideas were potentially more in tune with the religious dogma of the age, especially when it came to issues such as creation and the soul. And his was viewed by many as a sort of divine philosophy in contrast to Aristotle's more worldly thought, 
the, thus one principal function of Plato through the Renaissance was his exploitation as an anti-Aristotelian resource. As an aside, you might say Aristotle and Plato were the two faces of all Reformation theology. Indeed, the symbiotic charge of their dyad may be seen in Raphael's School of Athens, as you can see on this slide. And right in the centre, he juxtaposes Plato and Aristotle. More crucially, for anyone working on a text whose coordinates are essentially disputatious, it's worth examining the mould of the ancient authorities called up. It wasn't until dawn of the Enlightenment that individuals first attempted to supersede these, these ancient authorities and wield a new broom in a far more flagrant way. A good example being Francis Bacon's Novum Organon of the 17th century, which purported to replace Aristotle's hugely influential work on logic. And perhaps the most difficult aspect of classical reception I want to bridge today is that of reconciling the pagan production line with a Christian worldview. Put in stark terms, how is it possible for a church that persecuted heresy to exalt unmistakably secular themes and imagery? This was a conflict that exercised many right through the period. One of the most well-known expressions of this uh, uh, featured on the slide is Jerome's agony over his devotion to Cicero. In a Christian context, the elevation of pagan literature at all, let alone to hallowed status, was not an obvious conclusion. In the medieval period, one way of coping with the difficulty had been through the process of moral allegory, an interpretive strategy whereby a hidden moral lesson could be drawn out. Another approach that gained traction was assimilation at arm's length, for example, through an unequivocal assertion of Christian ascendancy. And in this respect, we might think of Dante's Inferno. While being deferential to classical authors, he leaves them in limbo. While he, a Christian poet, moves beyond all of them towards the celestial heights. As the Renaissance progressed, one encounters this type of negotiated accommodation again and again, as humanists sought to effect a union of pagan classics and religious faith, with classical authors sometimes even openly designated as Christians monkey, figures whose views were extremely useful, but ultimately flawed without divine revelation. An essentially problematic, especially problematic or classical author for the Christian mind was Ovid. Like Aristotle, Ovid had been widely read in the medieval period, his work The Metamorphoses, constituting as it did a rich repository of myth, was often referred to as the pagan Bible. He continued to be a favourite, and in the Renaissance there was an ebullition of new translations, especially of Ovid's work on love. And some of you may, for instance, know Christopher Marlowe's English to Amores. Now the sensual muse was allowed to speak for itself, but this posed dangers. How could an Ovidian treatment of love that encapsulated every desire under the sun from bestiality to incest and was sharply at variance with the heteronormative imperative of a Judeo-Christian culture be allowed to be painted, printed and promulgated. This problem has been addressed by several scholars, but I'm not sure in an entirely satisfactory way. I don't altogether agree with those who aver that pagan literature constituted a form of escape from the Christian present, or that it represented a wholly separate constituency to that of the true faith. Nor am I in concert with Stephen Greenblatt, who in his best-selling Renaissance tone, The Swerve, suggests that works like Lucretius's De Rerum Natura helped the early moderns to, and I quote, stop believing in God and start believing in itself. 
On the contrary, I don't think we can ignore the fact that very little Renaissance thought was secular. And my own view is that these ancient texts became stitched into the larger Christian moral framework of sin and salvation. The forms of love presented by Ovid contained an ambivalence. Yes, they illustrated the dangers of degenerate love that could lead to moral corruption, but they were also situated at one end of a spectrum that might lead a worshipper to a purer, more idealized form of love. In many ways, the presence of a pagan model posed a tough but helpful question. What type of love will you pursue? Errors are built into the fabric of Ovid's verse and characters in this work serve as witnesses to the dangers of transgression. The existence of the profane was useful insofar as the pious reader could draw important lessons from the stories of temptation and the admixture of blindness and insight on display. It is a noteworthy feature of Milton's Paradise Lost that the person who frequently, indeed frenziedly, reenacts Ovidian tales is Satan. A further intriguing phenomenon of the Renaissance reception of Ovid was that the exploitation was the exploitation not just of his poetic themes, but also of his authorial persona. Ovid's career went from poet of love to that of transformation, and finally to poet of exile, when Ovid seemed to regret his earlier libidinous frolics and comport himself as the dutiful husband and citizen. The trajectory seems to have been consciously followed, for instance, by a number of poets in the English Renaissance, and it's tempting to wonder to what extent this route was seen to embody a Christian path of penitence. Was Ovid's road to Thomas, in fact, the road to conversion? One way then to view the absorption of the ancients in a, into a Christian belief system was as a controlling mechanism, a sort of literary crusade or taming of the infidel. A final author I'll discuss today, um, the Greek Plutarch, offers further fertile ground for understanding the interaction between pagan and Christian traditions. Plutarch doesn't come onto our radars as much as he should, but for the early moderns, he was actually a much easier writer to slot into the Christian framework than Ovid. In fact, his popularity was in large part due to the resonance of his prose with the Christian code. This biographer and philosopher was virtually unknown in the Middle Ages in Western Europe, but in the Renaissance, the dissemination of Plutarch's writings, including the now famous Parallel Lives and the voluminous collection of mis miscellaneous essays, which came to be known as the Moralia, were legion. The high moralizing thrust of Plutarch's lies had an undoubted appeal. And for anyone who's dipped into these wonderfully vivid biographies, the constant motif of virtue and vice is immediately evident. And you'll see that in the extract on the slide. Likewise, in his Moralia, Plutarch, through his celebration of the doers of deeds, as well as the speakers of speeches, constantly returns to the idea of civic commitment. It was not too much of a leap for the early moderns to appreciate the didactic potential of his work and to claim him as coming close to Christ's preaching. Plutarch's precepts about virtuous habits certainly helped shape theological discourse, but where his, his impact was especially acute was in the realm of practical moral philosophy. The largest group of essays in the Moralia dealt with practical ethics, each tract being dedicated to a specific topic, such as how to restrain anger and how to sustain a successful marriage and so on. As much as Reformation concepts such as transubstantiation or predestination may have divided the church, 
most religious leaders and educators were quite frankly far more educated with day-to-day -day moral conduct. While a philosopher like Plato might draw philosophy down from heaven to earth, Plutarch brought it into men's private apartments and even into their bedchambers. It was this very practical nature of his works that made this writer so thoroughly attractive. So to wrap this up, I've tried to convey how deeply integral classical reception was to the early modern era. The classical world was repeatedly and relentlessly a unifying point of reference and a baseline assumption. The classical scholar Charles Martindale has suggested that a text is in fact only meaningful at the point of reception. An important insight that catches well a commitment to reception as a dialogue between past and present, and which conceives of reception and authorship not as antithetical, but part of a larger hermeneutic linkage. The term classicism is, I would suggest, too retrospective when it comes to assessing the Renaissance. And indeed, we should even be open to the idea that adoption of classical sources was so deeply hardwired that writers might not have even registered it consciously. While the process of repetition, reception necessarily encompasses a variety of forms and figures, it would not be unreasonable to point to a sort of law of Western literary history, the repeated return to the classical models. A writer like the English Thomas Nash understood this well, and in his highly satirical macaronic texts demonstrates an acute awareness of both the high dependence on and difference from Latin literature. But in the end, even he would have to acknowledge that the classical corpus was simply too useful a resource to abandon. While Renaissance authors didn't physically don the toga, we must never fail to ignore the extent to which an intimate engagement with Latin and Greek authors contributed to how we our Western forebears conceived of and expressed their identities as intellectual, social, political, and thoroughly modern animals.